Well, good morning to you all. My name is Andy. I'm one of the pastors here. Ben is away at the, uh, the 55 plus retreat at Sunnybrae. So if you go out there this afternoon, you might see him there. And um, he's just, I'm sure, just whooping it up there with, the, uh, with that crowd. And uh, he's a little, I just want to point this out, just so you know, he's a little closer to that age category than I am. Just, just saying. Um, I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis 14. We're making our way through uh, the book of Genesis. There's only 50 chapters, you know, it's no big deal. We're at chapter 14. Turn there or go to, the, to that place. Uh, if, you, if you get your Bible on an app, on your phone or tablet, uh, Genesis 14. And Genesis 14 is really, uh, it's an epic chapter. It's an epic, uh, but I think it can be summarized in four simple words. War, captivity, rescue, and generosity. Those four words summarize the entire chapter. War, captivity, rescue, and generosity. So first of all, war, and this is the first 10 verses. We're not going to read them. You can read them later and, and kind of get the, the, the history and, and the picture of what's going on there. But first of all, I want to go back to chapter 13, just the very end of chapter 13, where we left Abraham settling, it says, by the oaks of Mamre, and building an altar to the Lord. How nice. How nice for Abram, right? I mean, picture it. Abram had just been through a lot. He had been traveling extensively. He had gone as far away as Egypt because of a famine. He had just resolved a conflict between his herdsmen and those of his nephew Lot. The two of them had decided to part ways, and now God is bringing Abram into a place of rest. He's reminding him of his promise of land and offspring. It's almost like things were starting to click. Things were starting to settle down. It was all starting to make sense maybe a little bit. And then, seemingly strangely, chapter 14 opens with this, these 10 verses, this detailed description of a significant international conflict, a, a war. And like I said, we're not going to read it. I'll give you the summary here. Here's what happens. There's five kings who for 12 years served and presumably paid tribute to, perhaps in monetary form. They served this other king who was actually part of a group of four kings. And that went on for 12 years. Then in the 13th year, the five kings, the five little kings, they rebel. And in the 14th year, the four kings come down on a mission of conquest and to put these five little kings in their place. And ultimately, the five kings are defeated. Okay, that's the summary. So what? So what? Why does that matter? Why do we need to know this? Well, it just so happens that one of the five kings was a king of a place called Sodom. Verse 11 says, So the enemy took all the possessions of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their provisions and went their way. So Sodom... As part of this pentapolis, this group of five cities, each ruled by its own little king, uh, Sodom is defeated. Their attempted rebellion has been quashed, and now the people and the possessions are taken captive. Still, so what? Why, why is this important? Why do we need to know this? Well, we find out in verse 12 where it says, They also took Lot. They also took Lot, the son of Abram's brother, who was dwelling in Sodom and his possessions, and they went their way. So there's the connection, okay? There's the connection. That's why this matters. Lot, who's Abram's nephew and a resident of Sodom, has now been taken captive by enemy forces. So we've had this, this war. Now there's captivity. Lot is part of that captivity. Well, why was Lot there? Why was, he, why was he there in the first place? Why was he living in Sodom? How did he get there? What are the things that led up to this? Well, to answer that, we've got to go back just a little further, back into chapter 13. We'll pick it up at verse 8, and it says, Then Abram said to Lot, Let there be no strife between you and me, between your herdsmen and my herdsmen, for we are kinsmen. Is not the whole land before you? Separate yourself from me. If you take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you take the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes and saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered everywhere like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt in the direction of Zor. So Lot, this is verse 11, so Lot chose for himself all the Jordan Valley and Lot journeyed east. Thus they separated from each other 
Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled among the cities of the valley and moved his tent as far as Sodom. Now, by the way, verse 13, the men of Sodom were wicked, great sinners against the Lord. So, how did Lot end up in this situation, in captivity? Well, indirectly, by his own choosing. He, he didn't choose captivity. He didn't, he didn't sign up for it. He didn't volunteer for that. But indirectly, he was there in Sodom by his own choosing. Given the options, Lot chose to live in Sodom. 13.10 says that Lot saw that the Jordan Valley was well watered, like the Garden of the Lord, like Egypt, like a good place. It seemed, it seemed like a good place choice at the time. It seemed like a good idea. Has that ever happened to you? Where you've made a decision, you made a choice, you thought it was best, it, it seemed like the right thing, it seemed like a good thing, it seemed like a good idea, and then in the end it turned out to be kind of the opposite. It turned out to be something different than what you thought it was. Has that ever happened to you? Sure, it's happened to most of us. A number of years ago, when I uh, was younger, we, I went on a short-term missions trip to Tijuana, Mexico. There was a group of us young adults from our church, and we spent a couple of weeks down there. And um, one of the days down there, we, we, had, uh, we had some free time. So we thought, let's go to the beach. Seems like a good idea. We'll go to the beach. It's Mexico. It's warm. And we'll... Spend some time there, and it seemed like a good idea. And so we went to the beach, and we thought, hey, we're at the beach, we should swim. Seems like a good idea, we'll go swimming, because there's the water. Seemed obvious, you know, like a no-brainer. Somebody there had mentioned something about something called a rip current. We didn't know what that was. You know, we were from, we were from Terrace. We're not from near the ocean. We didn't know what a rip current was. And uh, so we thought, oh, whatever, we're just not supposed to go too deep. Okay, fine. We'll pay attention to that. And we're there at the beach and we're hanging out. And, and all of a sudden, there's a group of us standing there. And all of a sudden, we see these two lifeguards just sprinting down the beach, kind of, kind of coming our direction. And there's, they're just full on running. You know, they got their red shorts on. They got their, their red, you know, those little buoys. You know, it's like Mexican Baywatch, just all of a sudden, boom. And we're going, wow, this is crazy. What's going on? And uh, they throw their buoys into the water and they jump in the water and they're swimming out there and we look way, way, way out there and sure enough there's this this head, you know, this little head out there just sort of bobbing up and down on the surface of the water, way out there and we think, wow, that's insane. What's that guy doing out there? How did he get out there? How did that happen? So the lifeguards swim out to him and they, they get him. And we're like, wow, that's great. They got him and they swim him back in and we're all excited because they've rescued somebody and it's, it's, it's great. And they, they walk this guy up onto the beach and we look at him and we realize it's Roy. <laughs> it's Roy. It's one of our guys from our group. Not, it's not some tourist or some local. It's one of our own. We, knew, we know he's with us. Incredible. I couldn't, I couldn't believe it. Roy thought he was going to die that day. He said that you know, he had just been pulled out and pulled out, and no matter how much he swam forward, no matter how hard he tried, he just kept on going backwards further and further out into the Pacific Ocean, and he was yelling. Nobody could hear him. It was, it was scary for him. He almost drowned that day. He had been carried away by that rip current that we really knew nothing about, and, you know, sometimes we make decisions... We make choices and things happen that we didn't expect. Things that we didn't anticipate. You know, Lot moved into the Jordan Valley. He didn't expect to get caught up in, in an international conflict and to be taken away as a prisoner of war. Who, who knew? Who knew? My friend Roy went swimming that day and almost drowned. Who knew? Who knew? Well, you know who knew? God. Of course. Of course God knew. And he still knows. He knows your life. He knows the beginning and the end because he is the beginning and the end. He knows what's happened. He knows what's going to happen. He knows the ins and the outs. He knows the ups and the downs. He knows every challenge and every battle you face. He knows every detail. You know, when I was 
working in kids ministry and we'd, we'd had a, in our kids church way back in the day, we had kids come up for prayer if they had a prayer request and they'd come up and, and we'd pray for them and, you know, they wanted to pray for all kinds of what we thought were silly things, you know, a, a dead pet or uh, a lost shoe or, you know, all kinds of little things. And, and what I realized was, no, those, those are not little things. Those are important things to that child. And we, we used to pray, you know, God, thank you that you're concerned about every detail, every detail. You, you know, God, you know, you know it all. Psalm 139, 1 to 5 says, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it altogether. You hem me in behind and before and lay your hand upon me. God knows you. He knows your situation. And more than that, 2 Peter 2.9 says, The Lord knows, what does he know? He knows how to rescue the godly from trials. Just think about that for a minute. What trial are you facing right now? I don't, I don't know your life. I know the trials I face. What trial, what battle, what struggle, what thing are you facing? Think about that. The Lord knows how to rescue you from that. Isn't that, a, that's incredible. That's incredible. You are not alone. He knows and he understands and he cares. So when something unexpected happens and you find yourself carried away in the unforeseen consequences of some decision you made, some choice you made, or a decision that was perhaps made for you, Know this, that God is still in control. He still may yet intervene for your good and for his glory. But perhaps, in a way, Lot wasn't so innocent in the process that led to his captivity. Perhaps we shouldn't see Lot and maybe sometimes even ourselves, as being total victims. You know, we, we fall into this victim mentality sometimes, that I'm, I'm a victim, it's all, everybody's against me. Well, sometimes we are legitimately victims, but maybe not always. Maybe there's another side to the story. After all, thinking about Lot, you know, Lot chose to live in Sodom. He chose what he thought was best, and actually therein lies part of the problem. He chose what he thought was best. It was up to him. It was in his hands. Had he learned nothing about God's promise and God's covenant in the time that he had spent with Abraham, did he even attempt to seek out God's will in his decision-making process? And once he had, once he had moved to Sodom, where we're told that the people were wicked, great sinners against the Lord, did it even cross his mind to get out of there? Or did he just get used to it? Did he just shrug his shoulders and say, well, I guess this is, this is the way it is. Did he just adapt to the culture around him to the point that it didn't even bother him anymore? And eventually he just perhaps blended in. The book of Judges in the Bible tells us that at a certain time in history, Israel had no king and that everyone did what was right in his own eyes. That phrase is repeated in the book of Judges. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Do you know what that leads to? Well, in the book of Judges, we're told that it led to polytheism, a multitude of gods, none of which were actually God. It led to chaos, anarchy, in Lot's case, it led to his captivity, ultimately. And spiritually, in each of our lives, it leads to death. Ephesians 2 tells us that without Christ, without Christ, before we have Christ in our lives, we follow the course of this world. We follow the course of this world, and therefore we are dead in our trespasses, like Lot. We are captives, we are captives to sin, we are spiritually dead, just going about doing whatever is right in our own eyes. 
That's bad news, isn't it? That's really bad news. But there's good news. There's a better way. And in this story here in Genesis 14, there is a rescue on the horizon. It says, starting at verse 13, it says, Then one who had escaped, because remember, all these people were taken captive, Lot included. But one escaped. He came and told Abram the Hebrew, who was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eschol and Anner. These were allies of Abram. And when Abram heard that his kinsmen had been taken captive, what did he do? He led forth his trained men born in his house, 318 of them, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them to Hobah, north of Damascus. Then he brought back all the possessions and also brought back his kinsman Lot with his possessions and the women and the people. That, to me, is an incredible story, a true story of rescue. We're not told how many men Abram and his troop faced, but we are told that Abram had 318, 318 of his own loyal soldiers. And I kind of think that we're told that number not because it was a lot. I think we're told that number probably because it was very few. Remember, there's multiple kings, multiple armies that had taken these, these cities, these places captive. And Abram goes out there with his 318. The odds were against him. And it probably would have seemed that victory and that the rescue of Lot was highly unlikely. But notice a few things here, a few things about Abram. First of all, notice that Abram took action. You know, the odds were against him. It seemed, seemed unlikely. It actually didn't seem like the good thing to do in a way or the smart thing, but he did it anyways. He took action. He didn't wait for Lot to deserve redemption. He didn't wait for Lot to figure it out. He didn't hum and haw. He didn't ask a bunch of questions. He just knew the right thing to do and he did it. How many times do we know the right thing to do and we don't do it? God is speaking clearly and he's saying, you know what, here's what I have for you. And we, uh, you know, we wait and we hum and haw and we question and well, and we spiritualize it and I need more time to pray about it. And yeah, that sounds great. But you know, if God's speaking clearly and if God's leading clearly, what, what, what are we waiting for? What are we waiting for? Abraham took action. Verse 14 tells us that when Abraham heard about Lot's captivity, he rallied his troops and he went on the offensive. Secondly, notice that Abraham was smart. He was smart. The odds were not in his favor, so he had to be incredibly wise and strategic, taking a very calculated risk. There's, there was still risk, absolutely. There's absolutely risk involved. You know, when God calls us into something, there's no guarantee of safety necessarily. There's always risk, but it's a calculated risk. And verse 15 says that he did two things. He, he divided his forces and he attacked at night. Two very counterintuitive things that were actually brilliant strategies that totally worked. It's amazing. It's amazing. Abraham was smart. And thirdly, notice that Abraham was courageous. He was courageous. The fact that he took action and the manner in which he did <coughs> tells us that Abraham's courage level was soaring at this point. You know, when we try to imagine, or at least for me, when I try to imagine what Abraham, the man, the physical man, what he looked like, you know, sometimes I picture that, that image we have from Sunday school, right, with the, this kind of Middle Eastern looking guy with the beard, and he's got the shepherd's crook, and he's kind of shuffling along. He's Father Abraham, and he's very kindly, very fatherly looking, you know, that sort of thing. But in this story here in Genesis 14, I like to imagine Abram as Mel Gibson playing William Wallace in the movie Braveheart. Seen that movie? You know that one? You know, war paint on the face, massive sword in his hand. He's rallying his small but brave and loyal troop of warriors. He's a hero. He's a war hero, this guy. And it's this image of Abram as this 
this brave hero that stands in stark contrast to the Abraham we saw back in Genesis 12, the second half of Genesis 12, where he was in Egypt and where he was so fearful, so small-minded, so small-hearted, and so faithless that he even gave his own wife away to Pharaoh and said that she was his sister because he was convinced that the Egyptians would kill him because of her. He didn't trust God and his promise at all. His promise was, I'm going to give you offspring. Abraham freaked out and gave his own wife away. Crazy. So, why the change? Why, why, how did we get from that to this here in Genesis 14? Well, simply, Abraham trusted God and his promise. His courage came not from within himself in the sense that he mustered it up and tried harder. His courage came from beyond himself. His faith in, in God was growing. His faith in a God who is real, a God who is faithful, a God who is trustworthy. His faith that was credited to him as righteousness, the Bible tells us. Abram was courageous. He was smart and he took action. But perhaps... Perhaps the most significant aspect, though, of Abraham's rescue of Lot, this whole endeavor, is the picture and the parallel that it is of Christ's rescue of his elect. Here in Genesis 14, Abraham is, is a Christ type. He is a type of Christ. When we are much like Lot, Lot who had been carried away and held captive by another kingdom, Abram leaves his place of, place of rest and connection with God, and he does so to rescue his own, his kinsmen, and to bring him back to where he belongs. The Apostle Paul describes what this looks like for us and in terms of Christ's redemption of his own. This is Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. It says, He, that is God the Father, He has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and transferred us. I love that word in there. Transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. He, he scooped us up and he's brought us from that place of darkness and death and brought us into the kingdom of his beloved son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. It's incredible. So, if you are in Christ... You have been brought from one place to another. You've been transferred from darkness to light. You have been rescued from the penalty of sin. You have been brought from death to life. And we need to be clear about where we've been brought from. We need to be clear about that bad news as we consider the good news. We need to be clear about our position before and apart from Christ. You know, sometimes we think that as people, and people in general, that we're, we're pretty good. You know, we, we, we have the capacity to be pretty good people. We have the capacity somehow in and of ourselves to, to be alive in some way. There's some level of life within people. But you know what? If you are in Christ, then whatever goodness and whatever life there is, it's really only from Him. He's the giver of life. Jesus is the only one who's good. Without him, apart from him, there's actually nothing, at least nothing, that can eternally save you. I've often heard that analogy of a, uh, for salvation of a drowning man. And I think again of my friend Roy, who almost drowned that day. We, we use this analogy, you know, where there's, there's a drowning man and he's, his head is bobbing up and down. He's at the surface and he's clawing away at the water and he needs to be saved. He needs to be rescued. And that's kind of what was happening to my friend Roy. And then God comes along in the lifeboat and he throws the life preserver, which is Christ. And the man grabs onto the life preserver and, and he's saved. Yay, it's great. It sounds good, you know, but it's not quite right. It's not quite the whole story. The image of the man isn't quite right. R.C. Sproul puts it this way. He says the man isn't going under for the third time. You know, he's not, his head's not bobbing up and down. He's not clawing away at the surface. No, he is stone cold dead at the bottom of the ocean. 
And that's where you once were when you were dead in sin and trespasses and walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's Ephesians 2. You can read that later. It's a great chapter of the Bible. And while you were dead, while you were dead, the Bible says another, in another place that while we were yet sinners, not while we were good people partly alive, no, while, while you were dead, hath God quickened you together with Christ. God did something amazing. What did God do? God dove to the bottom of the sea. He took that drowned corpse and breathed into it the breath of his life and raised you from the dead. Isn't that incredible? That's what your rescue looks like. That's rescue. War, captivity, rescue, now generosity. Generosity. This is verses 17 to 24, and we're not going to read it. There's a bit of overlap here in our, in our series. This is actually the next message in the, in the series, but I just want to point out a couple of things about how, how Abraham concludes this whole episode. And here in these verses, 17 to 24, Abraham meets a couple of kings in a place called the King's Valley. And he meets two very different kings. And he responds to them kind of differently, but kind of the same in a way. It's, it's very interesting. The first king he meets is Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of God Most High. Very mysterious character in the Bible. He's referred to later in the New Testament. And he, he meets Abram there in the King's Valley, and he brings bread and wine. He brings something with him, a gift, an offering of some sort. And he, he blesses Abram, recognizing the touch of God on his life. He says, blessed be Abram by God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He's saying, look what God has done. Look what God has done. <coughs> and Abraham responds to this in a very interesting way. He responds by giving Melchizedek a tenth of everything, all, all the spoils of the battle. He gives him a tenth. An incredible response of generosity and worship to God. That's the first king. Then the second king Abraham meets is the king of Sodom. <clears throat> king of Sodom, who's now been defeated twice, <laughs> twice over. He's a two-time loser, this guy. And he, on the other hand, comes out there in the, in the valley. There's Abraham and Melchizedek, and he comes bringing nothing. He brings nothing. And the first two words out of his mouth are, give me. Give me, he says. He's a gimme. You know, you've met those people? Gimme this, gimme that. He's one of these people. He's just a, a real piece of work, this guy. A selfish, greedy, sore loser. And Abram, again, responds in such an amazing fashion. He says, no, I, you don't, no, 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 no. We're not doing this. <laughs> just make sure my men, my allies are looked after. That's it. I, I don't need you to think that you made me rich somehow. Abraham's selfless, generous, God-glorifying response speaks only of the humility of his heart and of his orientation to worship at that point. Think about it. He was the victor. He was the winner. He won. He deserved. He was entitled to all of the spoils of the war. He could have had it all. But what does he do? He responds with generosity. He responds in worship. He gives a tenth to Melchizedek. He makes sure that his men are looked after and he gives glory to God. One commentator says that perhaps the greatest test a man can face is the test of success. And this is exactly what Abraham was facing. He was facing the test of success. He had won. What was he going to do now? Was he going to shine the light on himself? Say, look at me, look what I did. Give me, give me, give me. No, no. He did the exact opposite and he worshiped generously. He passed the test of success with flying colors. 
So, what does this all mean for us today? War, captivity, rescue, generosity. What does this mean? Well, it means that we are sinners. It means that we are held captive by our sin until Christ rescues us and releases us from captivity. It means that as Christians, we have God to rely on in our lives. That we don't have to go around doing whatever we think is best. We don't have to make it up as we go along. We have his promises to trust and we have the truth of his word to go to. We have his will to be done and his kingdom to come. It means that we are free to worship. That we are free to worship. That we don't have to try to get the glory for ourselves. But we can give the glory, all of it, to God. We can worship generously in response to a God who has been so generous to us in giving us his one and only son that we would have life eternal and life abundant. Let's pray this morning. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this chapter of the Bible that matters to us that speaks to us today, that that is true, that is powerful, that has the, the potential to change us, Lord. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for rescue. Thank you that we can learn about your rescue of us from this historical account in your word. Thank you for the cross. Thank you, Lord, for eternity with you in heaven. Lord, I pray for anyone here today who does not know you and is spiritually living in captivity. Holy Spirit, draw that one to the heart of the Father through Jesus Christ, the Son. Lord, save rescue, redeem, set free in Jesus' name we pray. God, bring salvation today to individuals and even to whole households, Lord. Lord, I pray for anyone here today who has been carried away by the circumstances of their life. They've been carried away by the cares of this world by the consequences of perhaps spiritually uninformed decisions. Anyone that's been carried away by sin, by trials, by temptations, by hurt, by guilt and shame. Lord, you know how to rescue. You know how to rescue, and you alone can rescue. So, Jesus, I pray that you would intervene. You would intervene, Lord, in whatever situation each one of us is facing. Jesus, intervene for our good and for your glory. Lord, grant us that our faith might be increased, our faith in you, you who are completely trustworthy. Lord, increase our faith. Let us become more and more like you. And in doing so, may we somehow resemble the brave, courageous, yet humble and generous heart of Abraham. God Most High, El Elyon, we worship you today. We give you all of the glory and all of the honor, because it's yours anyways. All of the power and all of the praise is yours forever and ever and ever. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand today. Continue in worship.